Hey, babe. What are we talking about today? Well, I'm so excited. I always start with I'm so excited, but I really always am (laughs) so excited when we have new guests in the stew, because today we have Haley and Justin Brown Woods from The Price of Avocado Toast, one of my personal favorite podcasts. And I love the name. I know I'm kind of going off on a tangent already, but I love the name. And funny enough, Brandon's always like, only white people eat avocado toast. And I'm like, (laughs) That is not true. Like, what are you even talking about? But he, what was it? Last time you were like, I don't think I had an avocado until I was in my 20s or something ridiculous. That's true. (laughs) So it's just so relevant. And they are also a married millennial couple, just like we are. And the podcast is so similar to ours. And I just feel the vibes and the energy is always so good. Slid into their DMs and now they're here with us today. So Justin and Haley, thank you so much for being with us today. We're so excited to have you. Thank you so much for inviting us on. We're excited to chat. Yeah, it's always cool going on other podcasts, especially ones that are similar to ours, because it seems like we always get just as much of a takeaway as what we're maybe sharing with other listeners. So thanks for having us. Yes, of course. And I think there's a lot of Um, there's just a lot of similarities too, because I was in education, um, as were you. And then obviously I've now left, you guys have left, no looking back, no regrets on my (laughs) end anyway. Um, and so I just feel like, you know, our kind of life trajectories are going in a similar direction of like, let's be work optional. Let's do what we love every day when we wake up, you know, let's put, finance as um, a tool, right, to uh, to live the life that we want and to grow the families the way that we want um, them to be. And so it's just, I think it's going to be an exciting conversation. So, so the I'm thing excited. is, you say you left education, but you're still an educator. You're just not a teacher. You're just not in the classroom because you're, you're still educating. Teacher. That's you're still right. an educator though. Yeah. Totally. And we actually lean into that not all the much. time too. Like we... <laughs> We are still educators. We're still teaching. We just teach a new content and to different learners. But it's still the skills and backgrounds That's like right. of education is still super prevalent. And I think that's so valid because as educators, we obviously love the work that we do. But when you're in the classroom, there's so much red tape around everything and so much admin heavy work that, I mean, you're what teaching 20% out of all the things that you're actually doing, which takes away the joy. And at least now you guys get to build the curriculum and the lessons and the learnings the way you want them to be, which is really exciting. Yeah. So, okay. We need to tell people who you are and why we're talking to you. (laughs) Sorry. like to ramble. Um, Okay. Let's get into the bio and then we'll get into your first money memory and we'll let it roll from there. Sound good? (laughs) Okay. Awesome. Okay. Haley and Justin Brown Woods are a married millennial couple that began their debt-free journey in the fall of 2019 after blowing through a $600,000 lawsuit payout and racking up over $220,000 worth of debt in three and a half years. They got serious about changing the narrative they had created for their lives. In 18 months, they had paid off over $132,000 of debt and restarted their wealth journey. During this period, they began their podcast, Price of Avocado Toast. Their focus has been on having open and honest money conversations with others to help remove the stigmas and shame around finances. The hope is that these conversations enlighten the younger versions of themselves and save them from the pitfalls Haley and Justin fell into. Now, over 160,000 downloads later, Haley is a successful financial coach who has helped her clients pay off over $700,000 of debt. Justin has since left his career as a public school teacher and joined Haley's business full time. Their family is working towards generational wealth building and a future of outrageous generosity. Love it. (laughs) That is a great bio, y'all. Thank you for being here. This is, there's a lot to unpack in that bio. Yeah. As you're, we're going to get to it. (laughs) As you were talking, I was like, oh, that's, that's a loss that we've been through. (laughs) I, you're like reliving it. You're like, oh yeah, that we did do yeah. that. That was us. As soon as you said uh, blowing through the six hundred dollar, uh, six hundred thousand uh, dollar lawsuit settlement, I saw Justin's head just going, <laughs> <laughs> like reliving through that. You're process. like, how did I that. do that? Okay, wait. 
we're going to get to that. But let's start with with money memories, because we always feel like your first money memory and the way you grew up with money really dictates what you do with money and how you are towards money later in life. Right. I'm sure you guys would agree with that. Um, Justin, what's your first money memory? You know, it's a later memory. It's not one from when I was super, super young. I was probably 10, but it's one that I told Haley the other day that really struck a chord with me and it stayed with me in such a vivid memory since. My brother, I have a twin brother, he and I were playing baseball and playing catch and I threw a ball to him and he missed it and it shattered my mom's windshield. And I remember super vividly racing up the stairs to tell mom and then her telling us to get out of the house. And she essentially (laughs) locked us out until like 8 p.m. that night, which looking back on it, you know, in the early 2000s, isn't that (laughs) isn't that bad, I guess, you know. But uh, I just remember, <laughs> yes, yeah, I remember thinking how much that windshield was going to cost our family and that my household of a single mom who worked a minimum wage job at Safeway did not have that expendable income. We did not have extra to go around. And I remember how upset I felt and how sorry I was that I put my family in this position. And it's such a core memory for me. It's so vivid. I remember exactly where I was standing when it happened, exactly my path up the staircase into my mom's bedroom. It's really, really vivid. And so I would say that's probably my earliest money memory. What? Okay, I have to ask a follow-up. What happened after she let you back in the house that night? <laughs> we got back in and I think the next day, you know, we had it replaced for probably 200 bucks or something. And my mom never made a mention of it again. You know, I, I honestly had never okay. talked about it past that, even with her or even my brother. Uh, But it's just such a vivid memory for me. And it's so interesting looking back on that it's not a super early memory, but I think because, like I said, it's so vivid, it's so deep ingrained in me. So here's the guy me asking a quick question as far as, was it because your brother should have caught it or was it a bad throw? (laughs) Yes, he should have caught it. We were playing like, you know, yes, we were robbing (laughs) home runs. So we would throw the ball and the other one kind of had to track it and, and rob it. And um, it was just a little too inside my mom's car. And so he's leaning over the the hood, trying to reach for it. But he's a lefty and couldn't catch it appropriately with his right hand. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> All right. Well, now that the record has been set straight, it was it's his, his fault. fault. <laughs> exactly. You, you heard it here first, guys. You heard it here first. <laughs> Haley, what is your first money memory? I knew that you were going to ask this and I had to think back kind of far because I feel like money has just been a big part of my life in one way or another since like the beginning. But if I think of like the earliest, earliest memory, my grandma used, my great grandma used to have this gigantic container that she would just put coins in. And I remember being maybe like five or six years old and we'd go to the bank and get the little wrappers and then just wrap a bunch of coins. And she said, you know, if you can count all these out, it was, it, I don't even know if I was in like kindergarten yet. I was really young. She said, if you can count all of these and put them in, then we can go to the bank and we can like give you some of the money and then we go shopping and get some candy bars or whatever. And I do, I do remember rolling coins with my grandma. And I, yeah, it was pretty young. Thanks, Grandma. I love that. So she would give you a cut of the coins <laughs> yeah. for the work that you did rolling yep. them. Yep, she did. A little bit of paid labor. <laughs> yep. I love it. Paid me candy. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, how do you think that your your money memories and how you grew up with money as a couple that then got this huge settlement, right, the payout from the lawsuit – you get a check for $600,000. Like what, what goes through your head first off? I've never held a $600,000 check. So what is that like? I have just not for myself. <laughs> yeah, not the same. <laughs> your name's not on that. <laughs> well, Justin mentioned that he grew up with a single mom and I also grew up with a single mom. So that has a lot to impact with our relationship with money from the beginning. Um, our moms did the best that they could. They hustled but it just was really hard for them. So the financial education that we were given passed down from our parents was really just the best that they had at that time, which quite frankly was not very much financial education. And then when we got this money, we didn't really even know what to do. It's like when someone's unprepared to receive the lottery and they just win the lottery, it was kind of like, okay, 
well, now, now what do we do? I mean, you're the one that the check was in your name. How did you feel when you received that? It was overwhelming for sure. It was super overwhelming. I mean, like you said, you know, you're holding an amount of money that you don't really think you're ever going to have in your life. And obviously, I recognize it through my work history. You know, I would have earned that at some point, but you don't think that it's going to all sit in your bank at one time. And going back to my earliest money memory, you know, it's coming from a scarcity mindset of thinking we don't have enough. And I also remember times where when my family did have enough, the goal was to spend it on ourselves. I remember when my mom was getting tax refunds and we would all go to the mall and get some little thing. There wasn't an idea of saving or looking ahead towards the future. It was kind of all, let's just enjoy this while we have it because you never know when you're going to have money again and money is meant to be spent, which I do think is in some regards a healthy idea. But when it dropped into my lap with a $600,000 check, I didn't have the necessary tools and skills to be a good steward of that. and it led to some poor choices that you know ultimately found us in debt. Um, so I think really the, the deepest part of it all is just the scarcity mindset, the idea that there's never going to be enough. And so we might as well just enjoy it while we're here because the future is up in the air anyway. So why worry about it? So what did you spend 600,000 plus dollars on? <laughs> we we want to know. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Do you want to run down the list? Or you want me to yeah. start? Like, we, we did buy a house. We live in California. We bought a okay. half million dollar house, but we could have just paid cash for it. And we put about 275 or 270? About 270 in it. Yeah. 270 down for the down payment on a $530,000 house. So that's a massive, massive down payment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But then there's literally hundreds of thousands of dollars that kind of went unaccounted for. I mean, we've kind of gone through the list. Like Justin bought a car, which was like $30,000. He paid off his undergrad student loans, which was like maybe under $10,000. He helped me with some of the credit card debt that I brought into our relationship when when we first met, I think it was like 10,000 ish Mm -hmm. with that. And then we went on a vacation, spent some money there. We bought, uh, some technology, like we bought like computer camera TV, but all of those things collectively didn't add up to $600,000. Yeah. Cause we've done this reflection a lot over the last few years. Like what the heck was that? And quite frankly, it was just spent on lifestyle creep. Mm -hmm. just like day-to-day spending. And at the time, we must have been spending so much money because we were both working. And then we both Mm -hmm. were going to school, receiving like financial aid, refund, reimbursement checks, spending those on living expenses as well, as well as this $600,000. So uh, yeah, we were probably dropping like $10,000 a month just on living expenses. And at that time, this is a long time ago, that's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. We... Also did have a $30,000 wedding, which was totally worth it. That is one thing that we both say like we would do again in a heartbeat. It was the most fun. I would honestly love to relive that day any chance I get. So that was well worth it. Haley's engagement ring was $10,000. So that was added in there. I paid off my mom's car at the time, which I think was like 13 grand. And then the other wise financial thing we did was invest in my Roth IRA. So I put in for two years at the time when I got it because I got the check in, I got two checks. The first one was $60,000 and the second was 540. So when I got them, it was January and I think March. So I was still able to do the Roth for the previous year and the current year. And so we did invest in my Roth IRA as well for two years. So there were bigger chunks like that, but Haley's right. Predominantly, it was kind of lifestyle creep living in a town home or I should say renting a town home that we had no business affording until we bought the home. Um, going on plenty of dinner dates that included wine <laughs> and wine tastings that <laughs> like we probably didn't need to go on. Like dinner yeah. date on a Wednesday. <laughs> it's just, yeah, just lavish spending that we didn't need and, and we had no clue how to manage it all. See, I would give you some grace and say that you didn't necessarily blow through 600000 Reason being is that you did make some, you know, smart choices with the money. And I would say, you know, from the numbers you provided over half of it, I would say went towards smart choices. You know, we have shared, yeah, (laughs) we've shared this story so many times (laughs) with so many people on our show, on other podcasts. You're the first person I think who has said like, Hey, you did make some wise decisions. So thank you, Brandon. That makes my heart feel so good. 
I think that's the fi- that's, that's the financial advisor in me. Yeah, seriously. Yeah, looking for the positive. <laughs> I love that. That seriously makes me feel so good. Four years we've been sharing this story. And yeah. somebody's like, hey, you only blew through half of it. Don't worry. <laughs> Don't yeah. worry. Well, do you feel like, I mean, at any point, did you sit down and, and say, hey, here's how we're going to allocate this money. Here's what we want to do. Yes, we want to go on a couple nice vacations. Let's set aside 30K for the wedding, 10, you know, 10K for your ring. Like, at any point, was there a, let's write this down, let's list it out, let's have a conversation? Or was it, hey, it's in our account now, and let's just swipe until our heart's content? <laughs> Jessica, there was no conversation until it was spent. And then we were like, wait, what just happened? Yeah. Like, I think, at all. There was no yeah. conversation. I remember casually, we'd be like, oh, let's just transfer another $20,000 into our checking account. Like, no big deal. Frequently. And, yeah. Right. <laughs> there was no, there was zero. I- zero conversation which is crazy that's also like that's indicative of when you're younger yeah that's indicative when you're younger too you know like i would say that majority of people if they were in the same scenario would have done the same actually honestly i think majority people done worse because they probably wouldn't have spent half of it towards you know home do smart things Mm -hmm. much more of it would have gone towards things that they didn't need and you know just blowing money we were both also in, so, you know, like cupcake lane. So I think we were both just like <laughs> so enamored by one another. It was like, let's just spend on all the things fun because we love being around one another. And we had no clue how to talk about money. Aww. Yeah, it was. Oh, boy. There was this one time for Justin's birthday <laughs> and I made this. I got to go find it. I made this little like Word doc spreadsheet thing being like, OK, it's Justin's birthday. Here's how we're going to spend. He was turning 25. We're going to go spend like a thousand dollars at this like uh bed and breakfast go get massages then we're gonna go do a whole day like wine tasting pool day thing and then we're gonna go do a fancy dinner this it literally probably was like a twenty five hundred dollar two day birthday thing and if anyone wants to spend like that that's totally fine no judgment but looking back i'm like oh that's where it went little things like that (laughs) (laughs) little things like that that add up Little, little $2,500 birthday treats. Yes, yeah, just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I love that you guys have this story to share, though, because, I mean, especially at that age, right? I don't, I mean, I'm thinking about my spending habits in my 20s, and somebody hands me $600,000. Yeah, you probably don't think that that's going to run out anytime soon mm-hmm. until one day you wake up and you're like, oh, my God, where did my money go, right? And I think... I think you're in the majority. I don't think that most people, especially in their 20s, would have been like, yeah, let me max out all of my accounts and let me put this away. And like, sure, now we know, yeah, I probably could have quit my job if I did the right thing with $600,000, right? But that's not where our head is in our 20s. Unless you literally, I know we're all doing this for our children now, unless you're literally giving your children the financial tools that we wish we all would have had at our in our 20s right yeah. but that's just not the reality it's it's a lack of like i said it's a lack of financial literacy and um i say that even you know my upbringing i would say was different than other people's in the sense of more beneficial the fact that even though i was raised in a single household my mother raised my brother and i my mom was still more financially literate to a certain degree and she was also very frugal, frugal. and and so like you know money was not an issue thankfully in our household growing up but even to even in that scenario, I would have never had the proper financial literacy to handle six hundred thousand dollars at twenty five years old. Yeah, what's absolutely not. What's really crazy is like I I tell my clients all the time, this is a crazy amount of money, and yeah, that's a lot. But it actually doesn't matter that it was six hundred thousand dollars. We would have done the exact same thing if it was six thousand. We probably would have done the exact same thing if it was one point six million dollars. And it just came from the foundation of like we were not ready to receive that amount of money. It's the same thing that happens when someone receives a large tax refund of like five to ten thousand dollars. They they blink and it's spent by June first. It's the same thing, just on a crazy bigger level. I agree with you a hundred percent because, you know, with, with my clients, it's all about the behaviors. You know, if you are making say a hundred thousand dollars and you have bad behaviors and you're just thinking that, Hey, me making more money is going to fix all my problems. No, because when you start making more money, you haven't changed the behaviors. So you're going to be in the same scenario. 
just spending more on nicer things. Yeah. That brings us to uh, this is a good lead segue into you did have a wake up call, right? Of like, oh my gosh, where did our money go? And then it seems like you, you know, put your boots on and got to got to work because you paid off 130 plus thousand dollars in 18 months. How did you do that? Walk us through like your aha moment and then your plan to pay off a very significant amount of money. So the aha moment is our famous pumpkin muffin story. (laughs) And we laugh about it now because it's such a pivotal moment for us in our relationship. But we were both teaching at the time and Haley had worked closer to home and was off earlier than me. So she was able to go to Costco before I got home. And she had gone to Costco that day in October of 2019, I think it was. And I got home. She's eight months pregnant. And she says, I got these really good muffins from Costco. You're going to love them. They're like fall pumpkin muffins. And I see them in the kitchen. And my first response was... You know, why would you buy those? They weren't on the list and we don't have the money to be spending on extra muffins. And muffins at the time at Costco were $7. And we were and still are best friends. We just don't argue. And so for that to be my initial response, it took both of us by surprise. Like, whoa, wait a minute. We don't really talk to each other like that. And that was my immediate reaction. Something's up. Something's deeper here. And both of us identified it really quickly, which was important because almost immediately we both said, hey, this has to change. Something is going wrong to where we are stressing about my eight-month pregnant wife buying muffins. For $7. For $7. Any any partner that's got a pregnant wife should just say, I'm so glad you bought those muffins, honey. (laughs) Right. And I was not (laughs) in like, I was not in my right mind and, um, it, it caught us by surprise. So we realized that we had to change some things. And then from there we started listening to, um, Dave Ramsey, obviously a big personal finance podcast and show. And then we started following others in the personal finance community to figure out how we were going to tackle the debt. Do you want to talk about kind of our strategies there? Yeah. I just want to say we come from a huge place of privilege with us just really being on the same page from the beginning because we had that aha moment at the exact same time. That was the never again moment for both of us at the exact same time, which I think doesn't happen for a lot of couples. It kind of is like one person realizes it and then the next person significantly later. But we were on the same page from the beginning, like this needs to change. We're not working this hard to not have money for something that is $7. Like that's just not the life we want to live. So we went in hardcore on Dave Ramsey's plan and we just like cut everything. We cut our budget down to like the bare, bare bones. We went, well, we weren't really budgeting. We were not budgeting at all before that. So we started budgeting. We started tracking our expenses. We cut absolutely everything that was not necessary. And I mean, everything, it was bare And then Justin picked up a second job. He was bartending and serving tables while teaching full-time. I was doing photography on the side while teaching full-time, while also coaching swim. And he was coaching football. Like, we were doing everything we could to just make more money. And then everything went towards debt. We also took a really aggressive approach towards selling things. He's like the Facebook marketplace master. So anything that we weren't using, we were like, oh, we're going to sell this. You bought us this for our wedding gift. Thanks. Sold. (laughs) We, We were, he was on a mission. This was like his thing. And we actually did a couple things that were not necessarily the best financial moves if you're looking at it like from wealth building, but we pulled out the contributions from his Roth IRA and immediately paid off like $16,000 of credit card debt. And usually doing that is not going to be good for people. You know, you, you take this money and you're just going to put it on your debt and you're not really fixing the problem, like what got you there. But thankfully we were on the same page and we were like, okay, this is this is going to happen. We're going to do this. We refinanced our house, took some cash out to pay off some of the debts, like the car that we had at the time. He sold his car, which was paid off. So we just really got strategic and started doing a bunch of different stuff. And it catapulted like every single stimulus check or 
tax refund at the time. This was during COVID. Everything went towards our debt. And it was a very, very aggressive approach that I don't necessarily recommend for a lot of people because it can lead to burnout. But thankfully, it worked very well for us. And I can honestly say, we talk about this all the time, if we were ever to be in a situation where we had to like strap down again, I would do the exact same thing over again. Wow. I do have a follow-up question because, A, I love the muffins, right? Because you you were risking your life, Justin, in that Correct. moment, right? She's eight months pregnant and you're, you're like, we don't need the muffins. And she's like, I'm growing a human. Yes, we do. So, you know, kudos to you for surviving that moment. Glad you're here with us today. Um, <laughs> were you, were you at that time? Like, obviously the muffins stressed you out and it was coming from somewhere deeper. Were you crunching the numbers at that point? Or did you, were you like falling behind on bills? Like what was the catalyst and you being like, why would you buy $7 muffins? Like, were you crunching the numbers or figuring out like, whoa, we lost $600,000? What was that like? So this all happened in like September, October of 2019. But like June of that year, we went on a road trip and we listened to Dave Ramsey's Total Money Makeover book on the road trip, like the audio book. And so that's when we first got the idea of like, okay, we don't have to live in this credit card debt. Like we can kind of move some stuff around. So I was very like loosely trying to pay a little bit of extra here, 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 here up until that point. But there was not much strategy with crunching numbers until that point. So like, yeah, I would put an extra $200 on some random card here, an extra whatever we had, but there was no real strategy up until the pumpkin muffin time. And then once we added everything up, we're like, okay, we just had $600,000. Yeah. The wedding was the last little piece of the money. But somehow we accrued $27,000 in the last year. And once we added all of that up, and that was just credit cards, that's when we were like, okay, this is why, how, how is that happening? That was very quickly added. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's how we crunched the numbers. We just added them up one day and we're like, nope, <laughs> we, we cut our credit cards up. We went <laughs> extreme. And I would also say for people who maybe haven't listened to your podcast, I would recommend listening to it because then you get their full take on Dave Ramsey. Yeah, there's a good, what was it? A three-part series, yeah. right? Which is so funny that you guys did the Total Money Makeover and you were like, go Dave. And now you're like, uh, it's a cult, which we have our own opinions about good old Dave, obviously. But it, you know, it sounded like, it sounds like it helped you get to where you... It, it helped get you where you needed to go in that moment, yes. right? Before learning a new way, essentially. I always say that I like listening to all, you know, a variety mm -hmm. of people within the finance realm because I always say that you can normally find at least some piece of information or strategy, whatever it may be, from somebody that could be beneficial. I'm not saying that you should listen in. Everything they say is correct, but you can listen to a bunch of people and take the different pieces that you think would be beneficial to you. I said, like I said, I always say, I think there are some things that Dave Ramsey says that I agree with. I would say there's a lot of things that I personally just don't agree with. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think we also didn't really know where well, else to turn. Like all we. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. He was, he mm -hmm. was, he was the person. Right. Yeah. Everything that we knew was just like okay we have debt we want to pay it off and this is supposedly the guy that like helps you with that so that's where we turned and I think a lot of people find themselves in that position where they're like okay let's just follow this person because they're the loudest finance guru out there so let's just go this route and yeah over the over time we realized that necessarily wasn't how we wanted to do things but we did take what worked because there were things that did work for us. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily the right approach for everybody. But like I said, the bootstraps thing did work for us because that's how we function. Well, and I think there's value too, because you, you realize, okay, we can cut back in all of these areas, not saying, and I think you would agree probably now, like you still have to find joy, right? You still have to you know, save, invest, budget for, for things that are important, right? Like you still have to find joy in your day to day because like you said, Haley, that burnout is real. And if you're just paying off debt and you're just grinding to, to get to zero, right? 
but you haven't found any joy. You're not going out with friends. You're not even, you know, trying to find free things to do or, you know, hey, let's have a game night. It's not going to cost us anything. You still have to find joy to keep the journey going because otherwise, oh my gosh, it's just misery, right? So I think that's an important thing that, you know, people who are now like, okay, Dave Ramsey is not the only voice in finance, right? He's this old white dude. He is not a millennial. He, he's not facing the things that we're facing with student loans, the cost of strawberries alone, right? I mean, the cost of avocado toast, the price <laughs> of avocado toast, right? Like he grew up in a different time and we have to make adjustments that work for us while still living a life that we're excited about. So I do want to pivot into the price of avocado toast, how you guys came up with the name, how you went from, okay, we blew through $600,000. We paid off all this debt. Haley, you're now a financial coach. Like, Walk us through the journey of, hey, we want to share our story and I'm going to leave my career for this new adventure. Walk us through all of that. So during the pandemic, which was right at the start kind of of our debt-free journey, we realized that the folks that were around us and listening to us were probably getting burned out of us talking so much about finances. And so we thought, hey, what if we just started a podcast and like talked into the void about it? We kind of threw it up on an Instagram poll on Haley's personal account and um, said, you know, if we were to talk about this, what should we call it? And somebody said the cost of avocado toast. But that vowel sound of cost avocado toast just sounded really weird coming out of the mouth. And so we said, well, why don't we call it the price of avocado toast and just have that be it? And it's so funny when we look back, you know, Haley took essentially an intro to podcasting cohort group. We had no business spending money on her taking this, you know, cohort community. It was like $400. Yeah. But it was something that was like really pulling on her. And so I said, okay, you know, like go ahead and do it. And we started the podcast in 2020 and just kind of grew it from there. We never really thought it was going to be anything, but at the end of our first season of the show, Haley was having it on her heart that she was maybe wanting to go into financial coaching rather than head back into the classroom with the the kiddos at home. And so I just said at the end of our season one, Hey, Haley's going to start financial coaching next, next uh, season. So you've got a couple of months and then you can expect to work with Haley. And then we paused the recording and I told Haley, like, you've got like three months put together a business and what you want it to look like. And <laughs> you're like, it's go time. <laughs> yeah. You pushed me off the ledge. Yeah. I, I, I kind of threw her off the I ledge. I love yeah. it. That's good teamwork right there. <laughs> yeah. And so she, she started That's it awesome. in the fall of 2021 and it just absolutely took off last year, um, grew so much and she's helped so many people. And we were recognizing that there was only so much she could do. It was very limited. There's only so much uh, time in the day that you can serve. And she kind of tossed out the idea of like, well, what if you started working for me? And it's no, no, no. I really like being a classroom teacher. I'm, I'm loving what I do. But then I realized that we had kids at home and the opportunity to be with them was really weighing on me. I wanted to spend more time with the babies while they were young. And Haley had built a business that was going to allow me to come in and learn from her and train with her to be a financial coach for her business as well. And so at a, I think it was maybe February of 2023, I officially joined Haley kind of part-time. And then in June, when I left my teaching uh, position at the end of the year, I joined Haley full-time with her financial coaching business. And it's just been so much fun. You know, we, we love working together. I always make jokes and say that I love getting in trouble and having to go to HR because Haley <laughs> has to wear all of those hats. <laughs> and um, it's just been so much fun. It, it's been a great time and we're having a lot of fun doing what we're doing. I love that. I do have to, to call out that we started our podcast because Brandon wanted to constantly, <laughs> after a long day's work, talk to me about all the finance things. And I'm like, Love you, babe. Can you not? <laughs> and so I was like, we've got to give you a different outlet. <laughs> and I was like, and I literally, I had a dream about starting a podcast. I know it sounds cheesy and people don't believe it, but that is literally what happened. I like had this dream, woke up in the middle of the night, put it, put the idea with, even with the title, the sugar daddy podcast in my notes, went back to sleep, forgot about it for a couple of weeks until we were on a road trip. But that's literally, I think where it came from. I was like, 
probably constantly thinking about like, how can I get him to stop talking to me about this stuff? <laughs> Well, because all, I'm tired. <laughs> well, also, she would say as far as like, I'd, I'd say something. She's like, oh, you should make that a social media post. And I'm like, for me personally, one, I think I love the aspect of social media providing people access to information they previously did not have access to. But at the same time, I very much dislike people who put information out there in these little snippets and make it seem as though it's applicable to everybody. The headlines. Where like really a lot of the answers in finance are, it depends. It depends on what your situation is. And she'd be like, oh, make it a social media post. And I was like, no, like, I don't want to do that because I'm way too long-winded for way too what people want to look at. Yeah, yeah. So then the podcast was a perfect outlet for it. So again, look how much we're aligned there. I, I love that. There's so much line there. <laughs> what, what is so funny is during the podcast course, I think when you do something that you have to do, like – that you're designed to do weird things start to happen. But in the podcast course, they had me design this like avatar. Like, who are we talking to? Who's our audience? I named the avatar Kennedy and gave a bunch of information about her. Um, that was in 2020. And in <laughs> June of 2021, we had our second baby and named her Kennedy. <laughs> and I, I didn't even remember that. <laughs> Until like a year later, I was like, oh my God, this is so weird. That. The whole thing is just very serendipitous. It was, it was in you. Yeah, it was in me. It was <laughs> oozing out. I love it. So what, wh okay, talk us through the idea to become a financial coach. So the podcast has launched, you're helping people through the podcast. And then Justin, you're like, oh, by the way, she's starting this business, threw her off the ledge. Then what? Did you design a course? Did you start structuring like what you wanted to talk about, how you wanted to work with people? What did that look like for you? So we had a financial coach, Ryan, on our journey for a very short period of time. We met him through social media after we started the podcast and we started working with him for maybe six months or so. But while working with him, this is at the time of distance learning during covid I realized everyone else was miserable doing distance, distance learning. And I was like, this is the best thing ever working at home, working on a computer. <laughs> like, I don't know why everyone doesn't like this. This is my jam. And so I took that piece of wanting to work remotely because I'd never done that before with the experience of us working with our own financial coach and thought like, maybe I can do that too. Maybe this is something down the road you know, after we pay off all of our debt and life is perfect, then we can do that. So <laughs> I tossed it down the road for like, oh, we'll revisit this in like a year. But then the podcast started to grow and I kept talking about it and I just really wanted to do it, but I didn't really know where to start. And the person that we work with currently as our financial planner, he actually went through Financial Coach Academy. It's a course. Uh, to help coaches kind of start their business from the ground up. And he recommended it. So I decided I'll just give that a shot. And I invested, it was like $2,000 in this coaching program to get ready to become a financial coach. And honestly, some of the best money I've ever invested in because immediately I'm like in module three, like 30% through. And they're like, okay, now you guys need to start taking beta clients. It wasn't like, finish the whole thing and then shazam, it's good. It was very much step-by-step -step, um, building from the beginning and that's kind of how it got created. So I followed their outline and I initially wanted to take like three beta clients and I ended up with 12 and that was great. It gave me a great experience for like, we're going in full force. We're just going to do this. So I drafted up like things that I thought we would want to touch on. And then I just kind of figured it out with my beta clients while talking to all these people from across the United States being like, what are the pain points and what do we need to work on? I knew that it would be budgeting. I knew we would create a budget and create a debt payoff plan, but there's so much more to financial coaching than just the numbers piece. And that was something that I had to learn firsthand working with people and figuring out like, oh, this, this actually has nothing to do with your numbers. This has to do with how you were raised and this psychological aspect and all of that so all that honestly just came with time and experience working with people figuring out what we were going to do and so I've created a program now that's very much like a 
generic outline. But even then with every client, like we've got the outline, but we're not necessarily going to follow that outline because each person's very different and they have different needs and desires and goals and situations. So we kind of just customize it based off of each person. I can 100% relate to you <laughs> that it's, it's funny because most people think that, you know, as a financial advisor, they're like, Oh, you know, it's all about the numbers. You're a number person. I'm like the numbers. That's the easiest part. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, math is the same in every language. Two plus two always equals four. It's not that. And it's not that people don't know what they kind of should be doing. It's the behavior behind it. It's people's emotions and dealing with how each individual handles that scenario. I was like, that's the hardest part. I was like, if I can go back to school, I should have been a psych major. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. Because it's, it's like I said, it's all about dealing with emotions. And you could have, you know, two couples that on paper, from the number standpoint, are exactly the same. And you have to approach their, and they ha have the exact same goals they want to achieve. But you have to approach it a completely different way because they, you have to account for their individual emotions. And also, like you said, how they were brought up with money and having to work through that. So, you know, I'm really big on the behavioral finance aspect because I would say like I, the, I, I think one of the benefits that you have as like a financial coach is that I think the financial coaching is much newer than quote unquote financial advising. So they are taking to account a lot more of the things that really should be within all financial services as compared to from my end, like I had to start weaving that in on my own because I wasn't getting that type of training from, you know, my previous experiences. So I lean very much into the behavioral finance aspect where it's not the numbers that are the biggest important part. Those are easy. It's starting to deal with people's emotions. So. My long-winded answer. That's why I don't do social media. <laughs> no, I think that's a great answer. And you're right. You know, so often in financial services, it's marketed and, and spoken about in a numbers way. And I'm sure as you've seen, the large portion of folks that you work with, and particularly the large portion of folks that we work with, need all that behavioral stuff so much more. It is so much more important oh, yeah. to actually break down the habits and the goals, which is not always number based and all of these other mm -hmm. totally auxiliary things than just, hey, A plus B is going to equal C for you this time. And that's oh, yeah. what's kind of missing, unfortunately, from traditional financial education is just that it really does take a, a math lens versus all of the other stuff that I think, particularly in today's time and age, that we need even more. Oh, yeah, it's starting to definitely be an overhaul in regards to you. Have, so I'm 40 and I would say that I'm on the older end of the younger end of advisors. <laughs> and so you have like that a big gap where like now it goes from like 40 to like 60 year olds. And those are the ones that are doing the, you know, old way. And it's, you know, there's a lot of. Those are the that, ones giving the industry a bad reputation. Yes. <laughs> and so those people like myself, you know, that are trying to change it and make it one more accessible to more people. But then, like you said, also, as far as breaking it more down to just the numbers. Mm -hmm. I think that the behaviors we, drive the numbers. I think that when we were following Dave Ramsey, we got so good at paying off debt. Like that was the end goal. And the missing piece was for me, like, yeah, okay, we can pay off debt with vengeance, but like, how are we going to not get back into debt? And that's the problem with every single client I've had. Anybody can pay off debt. That's not the end goal. The end goal is some sort of freedom. People just want to not worry about money. And that means you need to break the cycle. You need to stop and say, we're not doing this anymore. We're going to break this permanently. And it's not like, oh, I paid off $10,000 and then, oops, now I'm in $50,000 of debt. We're, we're not doing that. We're not going to play that game. But that's where the hard work is required because it's it's kind of somewhat simple. The numbers are, that's the easy part. Like you said, Brandon, the numbers, mm -hmm. it's easy for someone to just pay off X amount of debt. But the hard part is the rest of it. Like, okay, the sustainability piece, we're going to stay out of debt and starting to really understand yourself and like why are you like for example why is an individual buying these certain things is there some type of underlying issue that we need to address that issue and once that issue is addressed it will definitely help fixing the quote-unquote you know overspending aspect and like you said that's what's missing from a lot of things like you know with 
Dave Ramsey's method, one of the things that reasons why I don't like his debt payoff method is, is because it sacrifices saving at the same time. Like a thousand dollars is not an emergency fund. I don't know of anyone whose emergency only costs a thousand dollars. That's <laughs> not an emergency. <laughs> So I'm really big on like, you know, you know, focusing on that emergency fund so that when you do pay off all your debt, you have also at the same time built up that substantial emergency fund. So when life happens again, you don't go right in the back of the debt. Mm -hmm. Because it will happen. And that's the piece. Yes. Life will happen. Yeah, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What was the the turning point for you all in your spending. So you, you know, you paid off the debt, you got really serious. Sounds like you took a lot of the joy out of life, right? <laughs> like you, you said you got rid of everything that was unnecessary. Now, obviously following you on social media, I can see that you're living a, a great life, right? You're finding the joy, you're splurging in the things that are important to you. Haley, your lashes always look great. Your Thank nails you. are always done, right? Some people would say like, don't spend money on those things. But again, we have to spend money on the things that bring us joy and help us live the lives that we want to live. So how did you cross that barrier of pay off debt, pay off debt, pay off debt? And now, okay, the debt's been paid. How do we now live this life that we really want to live within our means while saving, while investing, you know, while doing all the quote unquote, correct things, but still finding joy in every day and buying the Costco muffins that have since gone up from $7. <laughs> yeah. One of the really cool things about going through the debt-free journey and slashing everything in your budget is that you don't go out. And so when you don't go out, you have a lot of time to just sit and talk. And um, when you do the debt-free journey, when you're also quarantined, you have a lot of time to just sit and talk. And oh yeah, timing there is important. Yeah. yeah. You know, we we realized through the journey that there were things that we wanted in our life that we had never really even talked about that we were not going after simply because it, it wasn't anything we'd ever seen. And the big one for me was our family meal time. When we were spending lavishly, we were going out to eat constantly. I mean, it was just remarkable how much we were spending dining out. And so we cut that to zero immediately. It was, we are not going out at all, like no questions asked. And we were making every meal at home. And what that forced us to do was also sit and have dinner with each other at the table. And through that, we created a really great kind of family system of our family eats dinner at the table every night. That was not something I had ever experienced growing up. It was something for Haley but it was never something I had. It was really rushed dinners. It was a single mom trying to throw stuff together on a low income. So I just never really knew what family dinner time looked like. And as we've added kids to our family, it's been something that I really take comfort in coming home and sitting at the dinner table with my wife and kids and actually enjoying a meal with them that I got to cook and hearing them talk about their favorite part of the day so that was something that's really helped change for me was that going through the debt-free journey and pulling back on some of the spending actually illuminated what I wanted for my life. And it brought joy into my life, even though I thought I was removing it. And there's other examples of that. You know, we cut mm, streams, we cut Netflix and all of that stuff. And I realized that, you know, so much of my TV watching was like sports and so I still follow on Twitter and, or excuse me, X and, you know, other, <laughs> other sites and stuff. And I still get my sports fixed, but I don't need to have live streaming sports at all times. And it's just really illuminated for us what brings us joy in our life and what we actually want to spend on. So I know that the debt-free journey can be really intimidating to a lot of folks. It can be really scary to think, well, I'm cutting this and cutting that. But I think that everybody can find that there is that one thing that actually brings them joy or that brings them comfort. I don't know about you. Well, I think for me, it was just being on the same page about like why we were doing it. And I was not happy. Don't get it twisted. I was not happy to cut our TV and to cut my nails and to do all of those things from our like, that's what we were used to doing, right? We were spending so much money. So to go and just drastically cut all of that. It wasn't easy. I wasn't happy about it. But we were on the same page that, that this does not have to be forever. 
we can cut cable, we can do this, this, and this for a reason, for a season, we can be intentional, and then we can add things back. And it's so beautiful looking at our story, because I feel like we're literally living our best life. Like this is absolutely the perfect little scenario, right? We did everything for a for a season and now we get to bring those things back in. And it's just cool seeing like it wasn't forever. It was not forever. And and we would do it again in a heartbeat if we had to. It really taught me like we can do hard things. I can do hard things. If needed, I can cut all of this tomorrow. And the true things that matter are the two of us, our kids, our marriage, and just being happy with our family. And I think that because everything was so simple during our COVID time, we were in quarantine, we weren't dining out, we weren't doing all of the rest of the stuff. We were able to find the happiness in those moments, like going for a walk, that's free, but that brings us so much joy. And it doesn't have to be all of the rest of the stuff that people might think is materialistic. That can all go. Because at the end of the day, when we're when we're dead, we can't bring all the money and that stuff with us. It's the family piece that really matters the memories that we're creating with our kids every day that's the piece that matters and I feel like we were able to like what Justin said really unveil what that looks like in a simple form instead of like all of the rest of the frilly nilly stuff that we see in life and on social media I love everything that you said because one you know talking about the piece of both of you guys being on the same page that is huge because as you you know said before often people are not on the same page. Like maybe one person has a realization and it takes a while for the other person to come in. And I'm assuming a, you know, as you know, financial coaches, you've sat down with couples who you've realized are not on the same page at all. And it can be very awkward (laughs) because I have definitely been in those scenarios. But then I also like how you said you were outlining the life that you guys want to live. You know, what is important to you? Not what, you know, is important to your next door neighbor. Not what social media tells you should be important. What is important to you and how do you need to structure your life so that you can focus and have those things that are important to you? So like, I love all of that because that's right up my alley. Amazing. What is next for you guys, for your family, for Price of Avocado Toast? Tell us what's coming. I'm going to, I'm going to call it here. Ready? Sure. Okay. Yeah, affirm it. I love we're, it. We're going to just keep building this business and get to a point where we're able to really aggressively invest in our goals, whatever those are. And I really want to build a house. And we live in California, and that's going to be a lot of money. I want to build a house from the ground mm-hmm. up. I want to create the whole thing just like I want it. And that's my goal. Like, I'm very focused on doing that. And it's not going to be tomorrow. But I truly believe we're going to build the business big enough to where we can build a house in wine country in California. I think that's where we're going because that's what I that want. That sounds amazing. If you did it in North Carolina, it'd be a lot cheaper. I know. <laughs> I'm like, hey, let's <laughs> probably do it tomorrow. <laughs> we could move to Alabama. <laughs> yeah. So true. Oh, gosh. Don't do yeah, that. Ooh. Yeah. North, North Carolina sounds <laughs> no better to me. Yeah. What about you? What do you think? Than Alabama. Than Alabama. Yeah. Yeah. Um, where, where do you see this? Yeah. I don't know. You know, I think that. Right now, I'm I'm still kind of in the transition phase of leaving the teaching career and joining Haley. And so she has these tremendous ideas and, and great ways to grow. And I'm kind of like still trying to find my sea legs, I think, um, as an entrepreneur and as a, as a partner in the business. But one of the things that I'm really enjoying is, much like Haley did at the start, you know, I, I'm getting to the end of the program with several of my clients right now, and I'm seeing their progress and seeing their change. And it's really lighting me up to continue doing this work. And so I'm hopeful, honestly, that I can just continue to do this for as long as possible and be home with the babies while they're not in school yet. Um, beyond that, for the show itself, for Price of Avocado Toast, you know, we're up for a couple different awards for the podcast, for um, the Plutus Awards, which is a essentially an awards that celebrates content in the personal finance community. So I'm hopeful that we'll find out a little bit later today that, you know, maybe we won an award for our work. Um, But yeah, fingers fingers crossed. crossed. Thanks. Ultimately, I just want to continue to serve like as long as possible. It it really brings me so much joy to see people doing better. And I think that it is important work and necessary work. And I think that we're both so blessed to be able to do it. So my hope is just to continue to do it as long as possible in whatever capacity we're able to. 
That sounds exciting. And it's, I think too, for your clients, I'm sure it's really important for them to know that you've been through it. I think, you know, you, if you can find a coach who's been in the trenches, who's made the sacrifices, who can speak from experience, that means so much more than somebody who's like, oh yeah, I cashed out my trust fund and now I'm going to tell you how to live your best life. It's like, uh, no thanks, not interested in that version. So I'm, you know, I'm sure that your clients are super ingrained in like, okay, I can see the hope. I can see the the light at the end of the tunnel because Haley and Justin have been there and you guys are so wonderful and open about talking about the numbers, right? And those are, those are big numbers. And so I'm sure that gives them, you know, hope and excitement and energy to keep going and to trust you in the process. So I think that's fantastic. Where can people find you and connect with you? You can find us on all social media at Price of Avocado Toast. And our podcast, Price of Avocado Toast, is available anywhere where you listen to podcasts or where you're listening to this one today, right now. You could just go find us and subscribe. Yeah, subscribe, rate, and review both of our podcasts. Please and thank you. Um, (laughs) (laughs) We will, of course, link all of your socials in the show notes. Um, This has been such a fun conversation. Thank you for spending some time with us today and for sharing your really incredible story. And we're so proud of you for making it out on the other side after all of the sacrifices. And it's really great to see you now living on the other side of your best life um, in a sustainable way, might I add. <laughs> um, so we're, we're excited. We're rooting for you. We'll be following along on the journey. Um, and hopefully growing our friendship. So thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having us.